Good evening, everyone. I'm Dan McLean, and here briefly some stories coming up in our late edition at 11 o'clock tonight following the ball game. Charles Ng has been found fit to stand trial in Canada on a charge of attempted murder and other charges of theft and unlawful use of a firearm. The 24-year-old American appeared briefly in a Calgary courtroom this morning in handcuffs and leg irons, but was sent to see a psychiatrist. After being deemed fit to stand trial, he was remanded in custody until next Monday. Ng is wanted in the United States in connection with a series of murders in California. U.S. officials want him extradited. A strike this morning at CP Air lasted only hours and caused few delays. Negotiators for three unions and the airlines came to an agreement after an all-night bargaining session. A key suspect in a Quebec City murder of two police officers has received a bomb threat, forcing hospital officials to move him to another room today. Sergeant Serge Lefebvre is recovering in hospital after shooting himself a few days ago. The police officer from St. Foy near Quebec City is being held on a coroner's warrant as a material witness. And the release of an interview with former common speaker Lloyd Francis is being called a misunderstanding by the head of the parliamentary library, but he refuses to elaborate. Eric Spicer commissioned the interview for the public archives, and the tape was aired during the weekend by the CBC. The weather tonight, cloudy periods, chance of scattered showers, 16 or 61 the low. Tomorrow, sunny with cloudy periods, 27 or 81 the high. It is now 20 or 69. Full details coming up on Late Edition. We'll see you then. Serving Hamilton, Toronto, and the Niagara Peninsula, this is CHCH TV 11. The reason J.M. Schneider's customers always had such confidence in Schneider's wieners was because they never had to guess what went into them. Mothers knew that he used only quality ingredients, quality cuts of beef and pork, no meat byproducts. And as in JM's day, if you compare a few labels, you'll never find the phrase may contain on any Schneider's package. Think about it. Which wiener would you rather serve your family? At Schneider's, you can still taste the difference quality makes. Boots. For your body. For everybody. Everything to help a body feel good. Everything to help a body look beautiful. For care and savings, bring your body to Boots. Everybody needs Boots. On February 29th, 1968, I went to Ottawa to interview a young-looking aspirant for the leadership uh, of the Liberal Party, the Minister of Justice in the Pearson Cabinet, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Three years later, on April the 6th, 1971, not long after Quebec's October crisis, I went to Montreal to interview the leader of the newly formed Parti Québécois, René Lévesque. On this program, we will revisit both men the way they were, both on the threshold of power both with clearly formed political philosophies. Pierre Trudeau was one of several aspirants for the Liberal leadership when I interviewed him in Ottawa on February 29th, 1968. He was 46 years old. He'd only been a Liberal for two years. And now, I think maybe to his own surprise, he found himself running for Prime Minister. Or was it to his own surprise? Yes, I am now a bit used to the idea, but I was very surprised uh, as little as a few weeks ago. Do you really want to be Prime Minister now? Yes, now I've made up my mind, I really want to be Prime Minister. Badly? Badly, I want to be... I want, I want very much to be Prime Minister. I don't know how badly or goodly I'll be, but... What's the attraction for you? It wasn't an attraction a few weeks ago. You didn't even think of it. It wasn't even an attraction for you to go into politics, I don't think. You got in almost by accident. Now what is the attraction? What's happened to you inside? Well, what has happened is that, A, I have realized it was possible, and B, I've said that if I'm in politics and I'm in it to help change the society, I may as well go for the center, I may as well go for the top, and I may as well get where you can help the changes as much as possible. I mean, if you're going to be in politics, it's in order to try and influence <clears throat> the, um, the pace of change and the direction of change in the country. And that's why I got into politics, and that's why I, I became a minister. And when I saw it was possible to become a prime minister, well, I decided I must be that in order to, uh, you know, you go for the brain, you go for the, the middle of it. Do you, are you also capable of going for the jugular, which they tell me is an asset in politics? 
<laughs> well, I don't uh, no, I don't think I would go for the jugular. I don't. I, that, that's not my way of fighting. I, I, I'm a judoist, as you say. I'd rather go put people off balance. That's right. But are you tough enough to throw your friends and colleagues aside in the interests of political ambition, as you must do if you're prime minister? If somebody makes a mistake, cut them off and kick them out. I think I would apply to others the same test as I hope I would apply to myself. If uh, they can't do the job, uh, get rid of them. But uh, my friends uh, are people whom I think can do the job, and that's why they're my friends. But what if they make a blunder? What if Gerard Peltier was your friend? And you came into Pollux with him. You'd probably be a cabinet minister if you're prime minister. What if he makes a really bad blunder, as the kind of blunder that Guy Favreau once made in Mr. Pearson's cabinet? Will you keep him on out of friendship, or will you be able to have that kind of ruthlessness with Churchill, Roosevelt, and all the other great leaders and politicians had? You know, you're giving a specific example yes, about a high hypothetical unfair. problem. No, but uh, I, if it is unfair, but if there were a blunder, I don't think, and Peltier were in the cabinet, and he were causing it, I don't think I'd have to get rid of him. He would... He'd resign? He knows as much as I, but this is a hypothesis. In the same way as if I make a blunder, I'm... And, and, and the only way to uh, correct it is to get out. I hope I will get out and I'll have to wait till I'm pushed out. Are you in politics for good or will you get out if you don't make it now and somebody else that you don't agree with gets in? Uh, can you see yourself staying in this business forever now? Forever? Win or lose? Well, ever is a long time. But I'm certainly in the Liberal Party because I decided this was the vehicle for change that I thought the best. And, Suppose uh, you're in opposition. Will you be happy in opposition? You can't no power there. Well, I shouldn't say this, but if I'm in opposition, I'll probably just as happy, I'll be as perhaps be happier than uh, sometimes in power. But uh, it's more important to be in power, but I certainly wouldn't be unhappy in the opposition. And uh, once again, whoever is leader, just about every one of the candidates, uh, about everyone, has uh, you know, my, my admiration. I think they've all got some good aspects to them. And uh, frankly, I think it would be fun uh, staying in the party if they wanted to keep me in. Uh, I think they'll want to keep you, and there's not much doubt of that. Can you assess yourself, I've asked this of the other candidates, in terms of your weaknesses and strengths? Uh, let's be uh, modest first. What are your weaknesses? From a political point of view? Yeah, from a political point of view. Well, I haven't been in the party very long, as you said, and uh, therefore I don't know the rank and file very well. I haven't... Uh, I've been... A, across the country quite a bit, but not for political reasons. I don't know the party at large too well, uh, even uh, the members of parliament. Uh, I know those who are here now, but two years is a little time to be really acquainted with the, uh, the basic structure of a, a, a venerable machine like the Liberal Party machine. You know, this is a... Especially as, as a machine, as uh, some of your critics keep pointing out, you attacked not very many years ago. Well, this... This doesn't bother me. It bothers some people, but, you know, that's, that's their problem. It's not mine. I... That's, that's a political weakness. How about personal weaknesses? Are you able to assess yourself objectively? What would you like to change about yourself? About myself? What, yeah. What do you do wrong? <laughs> well, some people say, for instance, you're inflexible. As in your arguments with Mr. Johnson, you've been inflexible. Well, now you're not... I mean, I'll talk about this gladly. I'm inflexible. No, I think that uh, in the present circumstances, it's very important to have a, a clear-cut choice for the people of Quebec and of Canada. And in this sense, uh, I, uh, I know where I want to go, and in that sense, perhaps I'm inflexible. I don't... But isn't politics the art of compromise, the art of the possible? Yes, it is. But once you've decided what you've compromised and what you have decided is possible, I think you should go for it. And this doesn't mean that you shouldn't be supple and not able to compromise on the unimportant things. But uh, certainly politics for me is interesting if you know where you want to go and uh, if you are able to fight and push for that. But if, it, if, if you are in politics just for the sake of being in power and using means to be there which uh, don't uh, concord with your basic philosophy, there's no point. You know, it's, it's not power which is interesting, it's power for what. And uh, if I know what, then I'm inflexible. Let me ask you now to be immodest. 
What makes you think you're the best? What makes you think you'll be the best prime minister? You must think that or you wouldn't be running. Your friends think it, obviously. Mm. What have you got? I think the fact that uh, I am new to the Liberal Party and uh, new to the active political game is, is an asset. I think we're living in a society now which is changing very rapidly. And I think that acquired positions, knowledge of past events, important though it is, is not as important as, an, as a capability of adapting to changing times, of not only adapting to changing times, but being master of change and not the, and not the, the victim of it. And uh, to do this, I think you must be in politics in a fresh way. You can have been in for a long while, but I think you mustn't have vested interests in any particular aspect of an ideology or any particular aspect of a machine. I think that you, you were talking about being ruthless of not using useful people. I think you shouldn't use use, useless idea either and uh, or useless techniques. I think that a country like Canada, situated as it is in a world which is going through uh, an incredible turmoil, will have to adapt itself extremely rapidly to the changing times. And I think that it's an asset not to be, once again, too glued to the past. And uh, in this sense, I feel that, um, that I can do something. In another sense, too, of course, I feel that being familiar with the two linguistic communities, uh, it's perhaps easier to explain one to the other, and uh, it's easier to make up my own mind about the way they are thinking and the way they want to go. How about the argument in your own province that because you're from Quebec, you will lean over backwards to be, quote, fair, unquote, and won't give as much to Quebec as a friendly English-speaking prime minister might? Well, that is, uh, that is, I know, an argument. It's not one, of course, in which I believe. I hope that my ideas, I've always tried to evolve them independently of you know, whether I was Chinese or French-Canadian, and uh, what I think is the result of an assessment of our society and of the power forces at, at work in that society, and the results of, of my constitutional thinking is that uh, Canada must evolve in a certain direction, which is federalism and so on, and I think it's irrelevant uh, what my religion or what my mother language happens to be. I think people will judge me by these ideas and they will say this kind of solution is good for today's Canada and we will vote for him or they will think the contrary. But I think that that is the proper way of assessing me. It's by looking at the situation and seeing if my ideas and techniques uh, can bring any solutions to it. Let me ask you about the medium we're on right now, Mr. Trudeau. How important is television going to be in the future? Let me be specific and ask you the question I've asked the others. Would you be in favor of televising the procedures of Parliament? Not particularly. I don't have any moral or absolute principles against it. Um, I wouldn't object if it's done, but uh, I don't think it's interesting for the people to watch what is going on every moment of the day in the House of Commons. I can hardly stand it myself, so I don't see why we should impose it on well, the Let me put up to people. you, I, put up, I suggest to Mitchell Sharp that it might be an idea to have one UHF station set aside and just turn the cameras on. If people wanted to see what's going on in the House, they could. It's a kind of electronic hansard is the phrase I use. Well, quite frankly, if people want to look at it for entertainment purposes, to see the image, there's not much. Eh? You look at it once in a while and there's really no change. If it's for the message, the content, I think if you're really interested in that, you can read Hansard. I'm thinking of the effect on the uh, MPs themselves. Yeah, well, the effect on the MPs for me would be disastrous. We would all speak twice as long and make twice as many faces and, uh, you know, we'd be looking at that hasn't been true of the confederation conferences in both ottawa and toronto it seemed to have had a good effect on people there at least that's yes consensus. because it lasted three days and it was uh, it's like a drama you can go to a drama for three hours or a cinema but uh, you know you don't want to uh, look at people's lives from the moment they brush their teeth in the morning till the moment they put their pajamas on at night at least you want to see some parts of it but not all of it and uh, i in the same sense, I don't think it's interesting to the people to know every detail of, uh, every pictorial detail of what's happening in the House of Commons. I think it's just bad drama, and I think it, it's a waste of money, frankly. I have no 
no once again moral objection to it, but I don't think it's useful. I think that if you could, as happened last week, uh, have very active participation by good reporters, uh, getting people as they come out of the House of Commons and explaining to the people what's going inside, and perhaps once in a while, as in the Confederation of Tomorrow Conference, televise meetings of ministers or meetings of uh, provincial and federal people. This is good. But I think, uh, you know, too much is enough. Sergeants invite you to put yourself in your dog's place. Suppose you had the fleas, the itching, the scratching. You'd want relief on the double. You'd want him to give you Sergeant's new double layer flea and tick collar. Sergeant's double layers kill fleas and ticks like both a powder and a spray. And Sergeant's keeps killing for months and months. Your best friend needs relief on the double. Sergeant's new double layer flea and tick collar. He'd do it for you. Did you ever have to make up your mind To pick up on one and leave the other behind It's not often easy and not often kind Did you ever have to make up your mind Did you ever have to finally decide To say yes to one and let the other one die Double blue, blue and blue light Two great beers, one tough decision Did you ever have to finally decide René Levesque was a dispirited man. When I talked to him in Montreal in April 1971, the October crisis, the bad showing of his own party in the recent election had left its mark. And so I asked him about the rumors that said he was thinking of leaving the party. Have you ever been leader of anything? Well, that's one, one job I like to give to anybody. Because you're standing in the middle and everybody's pushing on you, tugging at you. And I hate the job. But really, from a practical point of view, where is the party Quebec uh, without René Levesque at the moment? Well, it is a personal party. Well, to be very simple about it, uh, I think it, the party was nowhere uh, up and until, including uh, last right. election, last spring. I think now it's pretty well rooted into Quebec politics. The National Union is, you know, disappearing little by little. So where the real opposition? In other words, a turn of the wheel or two turns of the wheel, especially if the present government keeps on aging as fast as it has. I don't think they need, there, there's no irreplaceable guy, not me or anybody else, and I think they need me much less now. Uh, as late as January, Le Devoir was predicting that you would resign, but I gather you have no intention of resigning now. No, you know what changed my mind, basically? And it, it was a feeling more than anything else. It's when those guys in Ottawa, Montreal and Quebec, Drapeau, Marchand, Trudeau, you know, all guys from our family started clamping down on Quebec and using the whole La Porte Cross thing as an opportunity to clamp down. Uh, I felt so bloody disgusted and I felt mad, uh, especially guys like Trudeau and Marchand, you know, the great Democrats of 15 years ago, forgetting practically everything that mm -hmm. I, I'd read of with them and in, in some cases written along with them. So that, that's the end of that. We've got to get rid of those guys, some day or other, Politically, I mean, personally, they can go on forever as far as I'm concerned. But that, that what, that's what made, made up my mind for me. Uh, along with the fact that after what they tried to do to us, because it was a political operation as much as they could make it, against <coughs> us or any kind of opposition to the status quo, there was, a, I think, an argument for not leaving for the moment because it would have looked as if, you know, yeah. you'd... You were fairly disillusioned after the election. I know you said that it had weakened your political moral batteries. What did you mean by that? Well, I meant batteries overall, uh, including physical. I mean, you yeah. come out of elections, especially when you haven't got much money and you're a new party and you have to uh, run around like mad for... Uh, we've, been, we've been doing it for two years, solid, and those five weeks of an election were, you know, like a sprint. How much well, sleep would you get a night? Well, during those five weeks, I... I I'd rather not remember. Uh, there, there wasn't much of it. And th that came at the tail end of two years of organizing from, literally, from, from scratch. So, uh, you know. But, uh, how, how about the fact that though you got the votes you predicted within a couple of percentage points, you didn't get the seat you predicted because the electoral system in this province. But, yeah, but uh, we, what we did predict was eight to 12 seats. Yeah. And uh, 
the reason we didn't get the 8 to 12, I think, basically has nothing to do with the electoral map. The electoral map and a few other things in the voting procedures explain the fact that we got 24% of the vote and mm -hmm. only even 8 or 10 seats would have been all right. Why we didn't get the 8 or 10 or 12 was basically our own bloody fault because we more or less were caught up in this surge. There was a real surge of support. And uh, we overextended at the end, you know, during instead the last of the week, instead of concentrating where we should have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Let me ask you about your, the form of what you, I think you call Canadian Union, which has been called by some uh, examiners of your platform a new kind of federalism. Uh, you're, you're talking about a common market with Canada, which Quebec would have sovereignty, and the rest of Canada would have its own sovereignty. Uh, I'm thinking of the map. I think maps are quite important here. Mm -hmm. What would be the words on the map of Canada, and would Quebec be a different color on it, in your view? In my view, yes. Quebec would be a different color. A, a country is a country. And when we talk about sovereign Quebec, in your English sense of the word, we're talking about a nation. In other words, a, a, a full, fully organized society. On the other hand, there's no reason why uh, the idea of Canadian Union, you know, which was in our first manifesto, is more or less a takeoff from what's being called more and more now the Scandinavian Union. Yeah. You know, Norway, Sweden, who were united for over, close split to 100 up, yeah. years, split up. And then along with Finland and Denmark more and more, they're becoming a sort of northern tier in Europe called the Scandinavian Union. They have common airlines, they have a common labor market, as far as I remember. They have quite a few common things in communications, things like that. And more and more, but on a free agreement basis, in other words, do we have a percentage on, you know, mutually in putting this, that, and the other thing in common? And they test it before they do it. Would you Remaining have... each at home in his own bloody little part because that's his society. A Norwegian is in, at home in Norway, and a Swede is at home in Sweden. I think it's the only way out. Would you have the, the same Minister of External Affairs as the no, rest? No, no, You'd no. You'd have your own Minister of External Look, Affairs. Look, in the year 2000, or 1990, if this, you know, getting back together on a basis of negotiated agreements about things that we do want to put in common, if that leads to that, why not? But. In the first period, I know damn well, I feel like a Quebecer, and I know Quebec would feel that way, that external affairs has to do with dealing with other countries. Well, getting out of that rather humiliating and degrading comedy that we've been having about external affairs, you know, a Quebec minister, is he going to be a vice president of a Canadian delegation in Africa? And is there going to be a fleur de lis next to the, uh, the, the, the maple leaf flag? And is there going to be an inch more or an inch less? You said Why something interesting about the uh, 1990 there. Uh, are you suggesting that it's possible that Quebec might separate into a customs union with Canada and then might rejoin again after they got things straightened no, out? No, the only thing I'm suggesting is that if we do learn to live, in a sense, side by side, economically and for various other things that in the civilized world people are putting in common more and more, in, in that sense, also together as in a new partnership, there's no reason why you can't imagine closer and closer links coming between neighbors, you know, over the years. It seems to be the trend all over the world. But at first, I think we need a breather, a rather important one. Didn't the United States start rather that way? You know, the sovereign states, the United States, were really in a very loose federation in the days of Washington and Jefferson. They've seen... Yeah. Well, you remember the hassle they had about setting up a constitution in That's right. six years or thereabouts? But yet, when they came up with the Constitution, they it had was a federal, a federal state. It was a federal system. Yeah. They found out that poly, uh, uh, I mean, uh, centrifugal forces were becoming too strong. And there was a sort of reaction, I think, and they brought it back to a, a union, but a political one, which... So you don't envisage any kind of political overall body at all, do you? No. No. No, uh, the same way as in Europe, a lot of talk, a lot of it loose, has been, you know, yeah. uh, made about eventual United States of Europe, in other words, a political union. Well, it, there's been talk for 10 or 15 years, and they're not any closer to it because they haven't even looked at the basic ingredients, you know, of, for instance, who deals with education in a multilingual potential Europe? Who deals with, you know, the minority problem of this, for instance, the, 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 the Dutch being only 10 million, uh, with the overwhelming strength of 60 million Germans and all that. 
you know, it's, it's all nice and loose talk, but uh, our experience and what we see throughout the world, with the one exception, and even they have their own little shocks of Switzerland with a thousand years behind them, it, it, the experience seems to be everywhere that the old 18th century idea of federalism is good for a melting pot. In other words, with a cultural union, uh, whether it's federal Germany or federal United States, except for the Negroes, but they have their own idea of how, about how they were melted in. But apart from that, it doesn't work anywhere. Uh, people need, if they, if they are one of those families of men that have their own culture, their own language, uh, their own at least part -wise, partly individual outlook, they need their own institutions to, you know, as the kids say, to, to do their own thing. Nobody beats the brick on fashion home furnishings. Buy this contemporary four-piece bedroom package, you get the full-size dresser, large mirror, door chest, and queen-size headboard, all four pieces, just $9.77. Or this oak and almond finished corner bunk bed, just $6.44. Or this five-piece dinette featuring oak veneer table and four matching chairs, all for just $5.98. Nobody beats the brick. Four Toronto locations, and now open in St. Catharines and Kitchener. Tomorrow, they're night partners. I'd like to introduce our new uh, victim volunteer advocacy program. Two housewives volunteer to aid victims of crime. Do you remember your first day, Joe? Were you excited? Yeah, until I got shot. With most unusual results. The car's dead. So are we. Don't miss Night Partners tomorrow at 9 here on TV 11. Join us. The interesting thing about um, both these interviews, the one in Ottawa with Pierre Trudeau back in 1968 and the one in Montreal with René Levesque in 1971, uh, is the consistency in attitudes expressed by both men. They're older now, but their points of views remain very much the same as they expressed them to me in the days when they stood on the threshold of power. A lot of people thought Levesque's days were numbered as leader of the PQ, and that that party would fall apart. They weren't, it didn't. And Trudeau, who could have predicted first Trudeau mania and then its direct opposite? And then perhaps the most significant of all the length of time he would hold office. So that's the way they were. Pierre Trudeau, Rennie Levesque. Yvette Mimieux and Diana Canova are two bored housewives turned cops with more action than they can handle. They're night partners tomorrow at 9. The Cincinnati Reds take on the New York Mets next on TV 11. <laughs>